Ever tried to stick a fridge magnet to something weird? Like an aluminum soda can or a handful of coins? You can push the magnet against them, but clunk, it just falls off. Meanwhile, that same magnet slams onto fridge doors and grabs iron nails like it got superpowers. What gives? We're told that only iron is magnetic. So, your poor soda can, made of aluminum, doesn't stand a chance. But is it true that only iron is magnetic? And can we pull off a little science trick to make a normally non-magnetic metal like magnesium act magnetic? Welcome to Cube Chemistry, where we will discuss all the elements of the periodic table and also do experiments. So if you like these videos and want to see more, make sure to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you will never have to miss another episode. Also, if you want to influence next week's element, make sure to fill in the poll in the post section of the channel. Let's talk magnetic materials. It's a common misconception that only iron, the metal in nails, paper clips and your fridge door, is magnetic. In reality, iron is just the most famous member of the magnetism club. Now, it got two close buddies, cobalt and nickel, which are also strongly magnetic metals. In fact, magnets will happily stick to nickel, try a strong magnet on a nickel coin in some currencies, or cobalt steel. There's a few other exotic elements that show magnetism under special conditions. Gadolinium we see you, but only when you are really, really cold. So no, iron isn't the only metal that magnets love. It's just a poster child of magnetism. Now here's a little twist. Just having iron inside something doesn't always make it magnetic. Huh? Well, for example, your blood contains iron atoms. And we need them to live. But you're not going to stick to a giant magnet like some superhero gone wrong. Now why is that? Because the iron in blood is all locked up in molecules, not free to line up and turn you into Magneto's best friend. Likewise, iron in certain compounds isn't magnetic either. Take iron sulfide, a pale green crystal used in gardening. It has iron in it, but a magnet won't pick it up. The iron has to be in metallic form for those magnetic domains to party together. So what does that mean in plain terms? Well, the iron atoms need to be uh, free and cozy enough to align their mini magnets. Even rust, iron oxide, is not ferromagnetic. It's a bummer that the flaky rust on old cars won't stick to a magnet. So the rule is, a metal can be magnetic, but not all metals are. And even iron must be in the right form. So we're probably going to get a lot of comments on this one, but we're going to try and explain magnetism in simple terms. Imagine every atom is a tiny spinning top with an itty bitty magnetic field. Kind of like each atom has a teeny bar magnet inside of it. In most materials, all those mini magnets point every which way, haphazardly. One atom, north, the other ones, south, a total chaotic mess. So overall, the material doesn't exhibit magnetism. It's like a classroom of kids, each shouting a different answer. It cancels out the noise. But in ferromagnetic materials, think iron, uh, nickel, cobalt, it's a different story. Their atoms like to naturally align in regions called domains. In an unmagnetized piece of iron, these domains are like separate teams pointing in random directions. But bring a strong magnet nearby and all those tiny atomic magnets start to line up. Like all teams playing on the same side. Now when the domains align, their magnetic fields add together into one big field. The metals become a magnet, at least temporarily, and jumps to the magnet in your hand. Remove the external magnet and sometimes those domains stay aligned. Congratulations, you just magnetized a nail. Or they relax again in materials that don't like to stay magnetized. So you can think of it like this. A ferromagnetic metal has the potential to be magnetic, but it's usually like a bunch of random compass needles. In contrast, a material like copper or aluminum won't have their atoms aligned. They refuse to cooperate, what we call paramagnetic or diamagnetic responses, which are either weak or opposite. But that's a story for another time. Now in ancient China, around 1000 AD, people discovered that a piece of lodestone, when freely suspended, mysteriously pointed north-south. The first compasses were born. 
Chinese sailors and later Vikings used magnetized needles or lodestone chunks to navigate the seas. No GPS, no Google Maps, just a sliver of magnetic rock guiding epic voyages. How cool is that? Jump to the scientific revolution. In 1600, English scientist William Gilbert studied magnetism deeply. He was a physician to Queen Elizabeth I, but he had a side gig experimenting with magnets. Gilbert concluded that the Earth itself is a giant magnet. That is why compasses point north. So he also found that heating iron could make it lose its magnetism. In other words, if you cook a magnet, it stops working. Something we now understand as reaching the Curie point, where those orderly domains fall into disarray. Then, in 1820, a happy accident by Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted bridged electricity and magnetism. During a lecture, Ørsted noticed a compass needle suddenly twitched whenever an electric current was switched on in a nearby wire. Electricity influencing a magnet? This was revolutionary. He discovered electromagnetism. Now, it showed that magnetism and electricity are two sides of the same coin, leading to inventions like electromagnets, motors and generators, and all the goodies that power our modern world. Ørsted basically paved the way for guys like Faraday and Tesla to harness the magnetic fields with electricity. Now, magnets aren't just some laboratory curiosity. They're inside many things around you. Sometimes we even take a non-magnetic material and add a magnetic coating or compound to make something new and useful. Let's check a few real-world examples across uh, different fields. Now, ever swiped a credit card or used an old VHS tape? Ask your parents if you don't know what it is. They work thanks to magnetic coatings. A credit card's black stripe is made out of tiny magnetic particles, usually iron oxide, embedded in plastic. Information, your account data, is stored by magnetizing those teeny bits in different patterns. Now, similarly, cassette tapes and VHS tapes have reels of plastic tape coated with iron oxide or other ferromagnetic material. When you recorded your mixtape or Saturday cartoons, you are magnetizing that coating to store sound and video. Now, even modern hard drives have disks with magnetic coatings where all your cat videos reside as magnetic bits. Essentially, we take a non-magnetic plastic or metal disk and give it a ferromagnetic skin so it can store data via magnetism. Cool, right? A piece of plastic becomes your bank account or your favorite song just by adding a sprinkle of magnetic dust. Now here's a high-tech application, stealth aircraft coatings. Fighter jets like the B-2 or the F-35 are designed to evade radar and one trick to use is special paint called radar absorbent material, RAM. A common type is nicknamed iron ball paint. Why? It's paint loaded with microscopic iron spheres. Now when the radar radio waves hit the plane, these tiny iron particles in the coating resonate to convert the radar energy into heat instead of reflecting it back. The result, a much smaller radio signal so the plane stays hidden. Now in essence, they coat a non-magnetic aircraft surface, composite or aluminum, with an iron-based material to give it electromagnetic stealth properties. Now here's another wild idea. Scientists at Brown University demonstrated a pill with a tiny magnet in it that you can hold in place inside your digestive tract using an external magnet. Now this could ensure the medicine is absorbed exactly where it's needed. And that brings us to the experiment of today, magnetic magnesium. You know that silvery metal in sparklers and old flashbulbs? Magnesium is famously not magnetic. It's about as magnet attractive as a potato. But we have a trick up our sleeve by coating it with iron in situ using chemistry. We just might make magnesium appear magnetic. Time to put our knowledge to the test with a hands-on and safe experiment. Now for the million dollar question, can we turn a non-magnetic metal magnetic? Specifically, what about magnesium? Now if you want to know more about magnesium, watch this episode because we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. So, bare magnesium is not magnetic. But here's our clever plan. We will use a bit of chemistry to coat the magnesium with a thin layer of iron. And if we succeed, the iron coating should be magnetic and get dragged by the magnet pulling the magnesium along for the ride. 
it's like giving magnesium a magnetic jacket to wear. Now, how do we do this? Well, with a little reaction called a single replacement reaction. Now, we've talked about this before in our Toxic Lake episode. We'll dunk magnesium in a solution of iron sulfate. Iron sulfate is a salt that dissolves in water. And by itself, it's not magnetic. The iron is locked in in ionic form. Magnesium, however, is a more reactive metal than iron. Now, when the magnesium metal sits in the iron sulfate solution, it will swap places with the iron. Magnesium atoms go into the solution and the iron ions exit the solution, turning into metallic iron and dispositioning onto the magnesium surface. This is the equation for that. Now, in plain English, that means that magnesium basically says, Hey, iron, I want your sulfate partner. You take a hike and go metal. And iron goes, sure thing, and plates out as a metal onto the magnesium. Now, the result, the magnesium gets coated into tiny bits of iron metal. That iron should be magnetic. So even though the magnesium itself hasn't become magnetic internally, it's now wearing a coat of ferromagnetic iron. From the outside, it might behave as if magnesium has turned magnetic. Time to test this experimentally and see if the reality matches the theory. Now, safety first, we're using iron sulfate, which is relatively safe, but you don't want to eat it or get it in your eyes. Gloves, goggles, and maybe an adult supervising if you're a kid trying to do this at home. Now, let's do this step by step. Now, for this experiment, we would need 5 grams of magnesium balls, 5 grams of copper sulfate, 5 grams of iron, 50 milliliters of distilled water, and a magnet. Now, first we have to test the plain magnesium. We take our magnesium metal, and in our case it's pretty ballsy, and we show that it's not attracted to a magnet. Now, you can see this, the magnesium might as well be saying, I'm not impressed, no magnet attraction at all, as expected. Now what we need is some iron sulfate solution. Now in order to do that, we will have to dissolve 5 grams of copper sulfate in 50 milliliters of water in a beaker and add 5 grams of iron into the copper sulfate. Now a displacement reaction occurs, which we have discussed in an episode about the toxic lake. Watch it if you haven't yet. Now this could take a few minutes to happen. Now make sure to pour only the liquid from the beaker into a new beaker and leave the iron and the solid products at the bottom of the original beaker. Now add about 2 to 5 grams of magnesium metal into the solution in the new beaker, in our case, the balls. Now we give it a gentle stir to help the reaction along. You might notice some fizzing or the solution turning cloudy or brownish. Now what is happening? Well, the magnesium is dissolving bit by bit and the iron particles are precipitating out, clinging to the magnesium surface. It can take a few minutes for a visible amount of iron to form. We waited about 20 minutes to be safe. Now let's see what we've got. Our magnesium looks different, doesn't it? A bit uglier, frankly. It now is coated with a dark layer, and that's iron metal, and possibly some iron oxide sticking to it. This looks good, but let's be sure. Now we don't want the attraction to be masked by just loose sludge. So we gently pour out the liquid and rinse the magnesium with some clean water. This leaves the magnesium with its new iron coating, but removes excess of soluble stuff. Now it's ready for the moment of truth. So now it's time to see if our magnetic magnesium has worked. And do the magnesium pieces leap to the magnet now? Look closely. Yes, it works. The magnesium, or rather the iron on it, is attracted to the magnet. The once non-magnetic metal now appears to be magnetic. It moves with the magnet's pull. Now, how cool is that? We basically made a composite. Magnesium on the inside, iron on the outside. The magnet doesn't know or care that the core is magnesium. It just sees the iron on the surface and says, come here, you. This is exactly what we predicted, but it's one thing to know it, and it's another one to actually make it happen and see it. So, what really happened here? Did the magnesium somehow turn into magnetic metal? Well, not exactly. We kind of cheated. I hope you're not disappointed by it, but in a smart way. 
Now, this is a classic replacement reaction. Magnesium has a crush on sulfate, kicks iron out, iron deposits as a metal. The net effect, magnesium gets coated with iron, often called a displacement deposition. If you want to sound fancy, you can say, we galvanically plated the magnesium with iron. Usually galvanic plating is with electricity, but here the chemistry did the plating. Today we took a journey from everyday observations. Why won't my magnet stick to this? Through the science basics, what makes materials magnetic? Sprinkled in some history and fun facts and ended with a hands-on experiment that looked like alchemy. Making a non-magnetic metal act magnetic. Now the big reveal was that we did not uh, literally make magnesium magnetic, but we gave it a coating and we hope you are not disappointed by it. Now if you think we missed anything, leave it in the comments and if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and maybe stick around, pun intended. Click subscribe and hit the notification bell so you will never have to miss another episode and also share it with a friend who still thinks only paper clips can stick to magnets.